All right. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'd like to start with uh, one of my favorite quotes. This is a quote by Aristotle from about 350 BC. Courage is the first of human qualities because it is the quality which guarantees the others. The reason I brought this up is because I think this whole event is an exercise in courage. And I want to especially thank Jane Orient for pursuing and organizing and pulling off this conference. It's uh, not an easy thing to do given the current uh, lockdowns all over the country and the difficulty of having in-person conferences. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the speakers and the participants in this conference. That takes courage to attend an event like this. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the people that I'm going to be quoting in my talk. Uh, they are, uh, each one of them, courageous in their own way um, regarding a very difficult subject on the state of academia in the United States. And I think this uh, talk will give a partial explanation why there are no college students at this event. Um, the University of California is very special to me because um, I've been affiliated with it since 1971. Um, and it's difficult to give a talk where you criticize an institution that's made possible your career. But when the situation gets to the state that it's in right now, you, you just have to uh, speak out. Um, now, right now, I've, most of my career has been at UCLA. Um, UCLA is ranked as the best public university in the United States. It receives about 135,000 applicants each year for the last few years. It's a tremendous bargain. The tuition for in-state students is only about $12,000 a year. And um, it's, uh, it's a tremendous um, institution with tremendous problems. And I'm going to focus on something that happened this year. Each decade uh, at UCLA, it's undergone reaccreditation. And this happened to be the year um, for the most recent accreditation, which occurred in February. And um, as part of this uh, organization, which goes by the initials WSCUC, they prepared a report that uh, was issued in December of last year. The team that wrote this report consisted of uh, highly accomplished academics uh, affiliated with other universities. The president of the University of Washington was the head of this team. It also included representatives from Stanford, UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, University of Wisconsin, and Indiana University. There wasn't a single person on the team that would classify, could be classified as a critic of higher education. So it's not unusual that um, they were uh, maybe not as critical as they could have been. Now, during the, uh, this process went on mostly during uh, 2019, but uh, I submitted and had other people submit eight um, third-party comments to this organization that were on the order of almost 400 pages of criticism. And all of these comments that were submitted were not not uh, reported either, or not commented on either in the report or in the letter that approved the reaccreditation, which came out on February 26th of this year. And so I requested an opportunity to, talk, to speak with uh, this Patricia Turner, who was the UCLA accreditation liaison officer and is a vice provost and dean at UCLA. Of course, my request was turned down. 
And um, so what I'm gonna go do is go through some of the, the key points here that uh, will illustrate what the problems are. Uh, and these problems don't just exist at UCLA. Uh, my comment, which I submitted on November uh, 4th of last year, is, is the basis is the strong evidence of violations of the UCLA mission statement in the areas of academic freedom, academic diversity, and research integrity. UCLA is violating these three phrases in its mission statement. To fulfill this mission, UCLA is committed to academic freedom in its fullest terms. In all of our pursuits, we share, we strive at once for excellence and diversity and as one of the world's great research universities, we are committed to ensuring excellence. The real uh, initial criticism of the University of California came in a 2012 California Association of Scholars, National Association of Scholars report entitled, a crisis of competence, the corrupting effect of political activism in the University of California. And this uh, provides strong evidence of the damage done uh, due to the liberal domination political activism of the faculty and administration. And several uh, recent commentaries um, by uh, UCLA students and other um, prominent uh, individuals uh, further illustrate the, the harm that's been done. And I'm gonna um, focus on four items um, here. Three of these were written by uh, college students. Uh, I'm incredibly impressed. The first, is by a, an undergraduate at St. Olaf College in Minnesota. And it's called the Assault on Academic Freedom at UCLA. Over the past few years, UCLA has lost four prominent scholars, James Enstrom, Keith Fink, Val Rust, and Tim Grossclose. Each incident is different, whether they left, resigned, or were forced out. But they all have a common thread, each professor took a stance against the left liberal principles at UCLA and now they're no longer teaching there. This attack on conservatism is not unique to UCLA, but the school has become a perfect case study for the phenomena. The converging timelines of these four professors' experiences show that rejection of intellectual freedom in academia is a pattern of behavior, not an isolated event. The second um, item is uh, by a well-known um, lady, tremendously courageous lady. This is in a September uh, 2018 Los Angeles Times op-ed. UCLA's infatuation with diversity is a costly diversion from its true mission by Heather McDonald. If Albert Einstein applied for a professorship at UCLA today, would he be hired? The answer is not clear. Starting this fall, all faculty applicants to UCLA must document their contributions to equity, diversity, and inclusion. The mandatory statements will be credited in the same manner as the rest of the applicant's portfolio. According to UCLA's EDI office. A contemporary Einstein may not meet the suggested evaluation criteria. Would his job talk, a presentation of one's scholarly accomplishments, reflect his contributions to equity, diversity, and inclusion? Unlikely. Would his research show in the words of the evaluation template, the potential to understand the barriers facing women and racial ethnic minorities, also unlikely. Would he have participated in service that applies up-to-date knowledge to problems, issues, and concerns of groups historically underrepresented 
in higher education. Sadly, he may not, he may have been focusing on the theory of general relativity instead. It does not do UCLA students any favors to teach them to see bias where there is none. You see uh, diversity bureaucracy is a costly diversion from the true mission of higher education, passing on to students um, with joy and gratitude the treasures of our cultural inheritance and expanding the boundaries of knowledge. Um, Heather McDonald is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and uh, in September of 2018 she wrote her latest book, The Diversity Delusion, How Race and Gender Pandering Corrupt the University and Undermine Its Culture. Um, the next item here is by a um, courageous uh, UCLA editorial board member of the student paper, the UCLA Daily Bruin, uh, Nora McNulty. Uh, Required diversity inclusion statements unfairly bias UCLA hiring process. UCLA's requirement that faculty candidates must submit an equity, diversity, and inclusion statement ch changes the hiring process to be about ideological activism rather than merit. In an effort to promote diversity, UCLA might just be doing the opposite. The university enacted a policy in May that requires all faculty candidates to submit a DEI statement as part of their application. A DEI statement is a short essay that lays out a candidate's past um, contributions and future plans to further uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. A university provided document explains that DEI contributions can come in the form of teaching, research, professional activity, and service. One example UCLA provides of an applicable contribution is scholarly research that investigates and brings to light institutional inequities. Candidate statements are scored by admissions officers on a rubric which grades applicants uh, on a scale from excellent to unable to judge with the end goal of dissecting their true merit. In layman's terms, the more your past actions and future intentions align with the UCLA administrative ideology, the more likely you are to be hired. While there's no um, question that the value of diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus, the uh, EDI mandate touches on a different issue altogether, the ethics of ideological vetting in the hiring process. A faculty candidate's fate should be primarily based on the educational and professional merit. Setting ideal activism as a prerequisite for acceptance, even as it relates to the most well-intentioned ideology, is wrong. UCLA is a public university meant to support a marketplace of ideas, freedom of speech, and diverse opinions. Although UCLA's EDI ideology is at face value indisputably good, it is not right to mandate related activism as a standard for hire. Diversity entails people of different backgrounds, races, ethnicities, genders, and the like. But it also entails diversity of thought. After all, differing ideologies spark productive debate and instill necessary checks and balances in an institution. It is crucial that UCLA remove EDI statements from faculty applications. If they remain, we will continue to use an ideological screening test to bar applicants from our university. The, the fourth item uh, here is also by another courageous uh, member of the Daily Bruin editorial board, William Blevins. 
from April of 2019. UCLA's skewed hiring process leads to lack of political intellectual diversity. A popular talking point in conservative circles is that universities are left-leaning ivory towers. They might be right, but not for the reasons they think. Contrary to what fiery conservative pundits would have you believe, it's not because of a vast right the vast left-wing conspiracy to brainwash the youth. Instead, it's probably a product of issues with UCLA's hiring practices. In fact, these practices could be responsible for the seeming lack of ideological and geographical diversity within the ranks of the faculty. The data is unambiguous. UCLA's faculty is composed overwhelmingly of liberal-leaning academics educated at prestigious coastal universities. This apparent lack of ideological um, diversity within UCLA's faculty can inhibit students' understanding of academic subjects, especially given the political homogeneity uh, might prevent them from being exposed to a full range of academic perspectives. It should be concerning that a wide variety of intellectual principles from economic perspectives to synthesis of current political issues are formed in the confines of classrooms increasingly unlikely to be headed by conservative professors. Any attempt to rectify the lack of intellectual diversity at UCLA must start with a thorough examination of university hiring practices. Students will continue to face deleterious effects of ideological homogeneity as long as the university advantages certain types of faculty candidates. Next, I'd like to go through um, statements by two uh, UC professors and then by a California businessman. First is a November um, 2019 comment by Tim Grossclose. At the time he was at UCLA, who was the Marvin Hoffenberger Endowed Professor of American Politics and Economics at UCLA. I believe that UCLA discriminates against professors who have conservative political views. Two of my research projects are especially relevant to the bias I'll discuss. During 2005 to 2008, I was a member of UCLA's Faculty Oversight Committee for undergraduate admissions. During that time, there was a widespread belief that the UCLA admissions staff was giving preferential uh, treatment to black and Latino students, which violated Proposition 209, a clause in the California Constitution. Near the end of my term on the committee, I asked admissions staff members for a random sample of 1,000 uh, applications. They refused. I asked several more times, and they continued to refuse. Eventually, I resigned um, in protest, and several media outlets reported my resignation. The incident led eventually to my writing a book, which is entitled Cheating, an Insider's Report on the Use of Race and Admissions at UCLA. Professor Goskos left UCLA in 2014 to become a George Mason University economics professor. Second item on this list involves a um, California businessman, uh, Norman Brown, who I became particularly close with regarding um, his uh, ability to stay in business in California. He wrote, I have strong evidence of violations of UCLA's mission statement in the areas of academic freedom, academic diversity of opinion, research integrity, and honesty. These violations are uh, quite evident due to the powerful UC and UCLA administrators and professors who were major contributors of lies and prevarications for several million dollars. The political activism and play for pay deal, a play for 
pay-for-play dealings of the university are beneath the standards of the mission statement and are conceived to achieve funding from the California Air Resources Board. Epidemiological studies were adulterated to infer premature deaths due to particulate matter, defined only by size, without any proof of toxicity, only conjecture derived from statistical noise. Breathing California air in the worst counties for 80 years would expose one to less particulate matter than one would breathe from smoking five cigarettes. Yet UCLA supported CARB regulations that destroyed my business, Delta Construction Company. All my 2009 to 2014 letters to UCLA were dismissed or ignored, making it possible for scientifically invalid UCLA environmental extremism to continue at the expense of millions of California businessmen and taxpayers like myself. This to me is a tragedy of misuse of science and hurts this uh, wonderful businessman like uh, Norman Brown. Uh, third is very important um, professor speaking out from UC Davis. This was in a uh, December 2019 Wall Street Journal op-ed, the university's new diversity oath by um, Dr. Abigail Thompson, the UC Davis uh, math chair. The current UC Regents standing order 101.1D states, no political test shall ever be considered in the appointment and promotion of any faculty member or employee. This is a statement of principle. No one will be denied a position at the University of California based on political beliefs. Now the university appears to be abandoning this principle. In the past few years, diversity, equity, inclusion statements in which applicants for faculty positions profess their commitment to these social goals have become required on eight UC campuses and at colleges across the country. But I have become increasingly uneasy with the use of DEI statements in faculty hiring. This spring, the university issued guidelines instructing each campus uh, to develop and use a scoring system called a rubric for applicants' diversity statements. No longer will faculty hiring committees use their own judgment about how to best create a diverse and inclusive environment in their fields. Instead, each candidate's commitment to diversity will be assigned points. To score well, candidates must subscribe to a particular political ideology one based on treating people in a unique, uh, not as unique individuals, but as representatives of their gender and ethnic, ethnic identities. Mandatory diversity statements can too easily become a test of political ideology. Uh, remember, no political test shall ever be considered in the appointment and proportion of any faculty member or employee. This fundamental principle must not be abandoned. Now let me give you an example of what has happened. Uh, this is an appointment at UC Berkeley that occurred during 2018 to 2019. Um, in an area that's directly related to my, a lot of my research on environmental epidemiology. It was, the position was in environmental science, policy, and management. And if you can see in the column on the left, um, the um, applicant pool included 360 individuals, almost 60% of whom uh, were whites. Now, when they pared that down um, to the um, long list of candidates, which was 80, the percentage of whites went down to 
about 53%. When they went to the short list of five candidates, the percentage went to zero. So it's obviously not only the excluding whites, they're, they're making the candidates that remain even more liberal because they're being selected by liberal professors that already are in place there. And so this is a dramatic example that uh, Professor Thompson wanted everyone to see. She sent me these documents which are not readily available uh, because she's dug into this and it's, um, uh, it's a frightening thing that they're gonna now evaluate people um, on these factors like race and ethnicity um, and they're gonna make the professorship even more liberal than it already is. Um, uh, next, we come to another uh, professor that has done a tremendous job. He was involved in writing the 2012 report uh, for the California Association of Scholars, National Association of Scholars. And then he um, published a book that just came out um, literally within the last uh, two months called The Breakdown of Higher Education, How It Happened, The Damage It Does, and What Can Be Done. His name is uh, John Ellis. He was a UC Santa Cruz a professor in um, German uh, literature and history. And um, he uh, wrote an op-ed which sort of summarizes his book in July 6th, uh, Wall Street Journal, entitled Campus Culture Seizes the Streets. Um, a a well-known professional standard for college professors warns against taking advantage of the student's immaturity by indoctrinating him with the teacher's own opinions before the student has had an opportunity to fairly examine other opinions upon the matters in question and before he has sufficient knowledge and ripeness of judgment to be entitled to form any definitive opinion of his own. That statement from the American Association of University Professors dates from 1915 and is still in force. Most campuses have similar rules of their own, yet across the country these categorical prohibitions are now ignored. Academia has become politicized from top to bottom. A typical example, California's constitution spells out that the University of California shall be entirely independent of all political and sectarian influence and kept free therefrom. Yet politicization is now routine. Professors indoctrinate students seemingly unconcerned with the vast gulf between what their rules forbid them to do and what they are openly doing. Bitter experience has now shown that the, uh, those rules were there for good reason. Education used to understand that politics would destroy academic, academia's public credibility and internal ability to function. Political ends would stifle free inquiry. Tribalization would erode analytical thought. And emotion would replace reason. Those, foreboding match, those forebodings match exactly distortions of higher education that, that we are now seeing. Universities used to be places where the major political and social issues of the day could be researched and debated. The results of this uh, careful thought and analysis were used to make political debates in the wider world more realistic and better informed. That, all that has now been turned on its head. The campus offers not a reason collective to partisan 
passions, but fierce one-sided advocacy of dangerous and destructive ideas. Taxpayers, lawmakers, and donors need to wake from the spell cast by American universities past glory. Only then can they summon the courage to withdraw funding and force necessary change, replacing academic political activists with real academic thinkers, people who care about original thought, not peddling an ideology. And um, just a, a short example of how this uh, suppresses um, my, uh, my interests um, on the current situation. Um, I've never really focused on infectious diseases, but because of the impact of coronavirus, I have uh, teamed up with some independent-minded professors at UCLA and, um, and the Hoover Institution, and I wrote two um, op-eds in the Daily Signal, which is a Heritage Foundation publication. One is on uh, flawed models. Uh, let me move to the next. Excuse me, this one. Yeah, the second I... Flawed models uh, show why uh, COVID-19 policies must consider total mortality, and the other is reopening of California justified by lower total COVID-19 deaths. So this is the notion that you have not only coronavirus deaths, but what has happened to total mortality. And uh, actually, not as much as you would think. Uh, there was a major flu epidemic in uh, 2018, and if you look at the deaths in the first half of 2018 versus 2000 uh, this year, uh, there's not as much difference as you think. And um, it's important to understand what the overall impact is because this uh, pandemic is affecting uh, mainly older people that are at uh, or above life expectancy. And and so this is a concept that, that really needs more examination, and it's hard to get it uh, analyzed because the focus is on just the daily count of cases. Uh, my other point is that there's variation, tremendous variation in the rates across the country. California currently has um, close to the lowest death rates, total age-adjusted death rates of any state in the United States. The only one that's uh, really similar is Hawaii. Uh, but the point is, uh, none of this overall healthiness of California is taken into account by the powerful governor and the powerful mayor of Los Angeles. And so they, there's a total distortion. We have, for the first time in history, this, um, this complete lockdown of society, which is in violation of many parts of the U.S. Constitution. And so it would be something I'd like to pursue more, and I'm doing the best I can, but when you get no support from any of the people in the school where I spent my career in the School of Public Health, they just sit silently by and let the politicians uh, dictate um, policy. It's very difficult to speak out. And... Um, and I'm already in trouble for my environmental epidemiology. So one individual can only take so many hits. <laughs> and so this is why uh, uh, we see uh, so few um, uh, critics um, or uh, skeptics out there. And so um, I'm going to pursue these things the best I can. But when uh, you, you get an idea of how tough it is, to present minority points of view. And this issue right now, which is affecting this conference and everything in the United States, really depends on the profession that I've been in, epidemiology. And yet there's basically dead silence from virtually every epidemiologist in the United States, except a few. I've found this wonderful professor from Yale named uh, Harvey Reich, who actually originated here from Southern California, well, he originated in Southern California, got his undergraduate training at Caltech. Um, and he, um, he's been willing to speak out on this controversial potential treatment, uh, hydroxychloroquine, and uh, been battered for that uh, because his view is a minority view. 
but at least he's uh, talking and presenting evidence, even getting some of it peer-reviewed, which is very difficult. So in any case, um, what I'd like to show now is just further evidence that supports uh, Professor Ellis and the... Um, and this involves a website called opensecrets.org, uh, which tabulates political donations from all sorts of organizations to all the candidates in the United States. And if you look at what they have for the University of California, you see that the total um, election cycle uh, contributions as of uh, Wednesday, uh, August 12th, if you do this for all federal candidates, uh, Democrats versus Republicans, it's a um, ratio of 44 to, to 1. That's a university where politics is not supposed to be allowed. But that's how corrupted it's become. And uh, if you look at this just for the presidential uh, race, the top three Democratic candidates um, Sanders, Biden, and Warren versus the president, it's basically the same ratio, 43 to 1. So that means about 2% of the contributions are coming uh, from Republicans. I would say that that's probably the current <laughs> percentage of faculty members that are Republicans. The percentage of faculty members that are willing to speak out is substantially less than 2%. Um, and uh, there are probably a lot of others that don't disclose, many don't disclose their political uh, beliefs. Um, but this pattern goes back, especially uh, 2016, if you see what it was with Clinton versus Trump, the ratio was closer to 100 to 1 in that race. And this is a university that is funded by all the taxpayers, approximately 25% of the uh, registered voters in California are uh, Republicans, not 2%. So it's a total distortion for this public university funded by all the taxpayers to be this imbalanced. But that's the state that we live in, or that I live in, anyway. Uh, this is um, a letter from another... Um, courageous UCLA student uh, who wants to remain anonymous. This was a letter uh, that was written um, in um, June uh, to the um, Los Angeles County Board of Education um, just before it endorsed the California Constitutional Amendment ACA 5 which is now on the November 3rd ballot as Proposition 16. To whom it may concern, I urge members of the board to vote no on ACA 5. ACA 5 is a Band-Aid for a gunshot wound, and I hope that in hearing my perspective, that of a recently graduated UCLA student, you will see why. As a child of an immigrant who grew up in a low-income area less than two miles north of the U.S.-Mexico border, I experienced inequity firsthand. In my situation, I was one of the poorest high school students, but I was white in an over 90% minority high school. I worked multiple jobs on top of playing five varsity sports, caring for three younger siblings, and working for pay my dad's medical bills. I also took over a dozen community college classes in high school and worked extremely hard to graduate from UCLA two, early, two years early to save myself from the burden of student loans. Upon attending UCLA, I met students of all backgrounds, kids who came from private schools, the most prestigious prep schools in the world, public schools, and some of the country's worst schools, and every individual seemed equally as competent in a four-year university. ACA 5 is not a solution to a problem facing those most disadvantaged in society. 
this, uh, this student has particular uh, uh, re uh, relevance to me because she went, um, she went to high school about 10 miles from where I went to high school decades ago in San Diego. And uh, we both somehow managed to come out of very poor circumstances. Um, I benefited by having a great, uh, great teachers and great classmates. And she did it more on her own perseverance. But it's sad that someone like this, so talented, doesn't even want to reveal name, her name. Uh, even though she's graduated, because it may impact her a future. Um, uh, but this is, a, this is the, the crazy world we live in. So I call these students that I've quieted the one in 10,000 group. Uh, there are about 45,000 students at UCLA, and I think there's only about five that are willing to even write op-eds, like the ones that were in the Daily Bruin or like this student that wrote this comment to the uh, Board of Education, which simply ignored it. They're not going to bother with uh, um, someone's statement like that. Um, I'd like to uh, basically end with uh, uh, the op-ed that came out in the Orange County Register uh, last Sunday, August 9th. Uh, by Ward Connerly, who was actively involved in passing Proposition 209 in 1996 when he was a regent um, of the University of California. Prop 13, excuse me, Prop 16 threatens California's commitment to equality. The fundamental nature of our nation is that we are a collection of free people who have rights given to us by our uh, creator, liberty and equality are precious rights deemed essential to our pursuit of that which fulfills our objective of happiness. More than just for the pursuit of happiness, however, equality is essential to the maintenance of a civil society. It is essential um, in a state now identified as majority minority. The promise of equality is a motivating force of profound significance to all of us. As a young college graduate seeking a job in the early 1960s, I searched for the words, an equal opportunity employer at the bottom of the job announcements. These words represented a welcome sign to enter based on my merits. The door would not be closed to me because of the color of my brown skin. The California Constitution contains these words. The state shall not discriminate against nor grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the operation of public employment, public education or public contracting. This is how it should be. I ask all of you to vote no on Proposition 16, which would delete that commitment to equality from the California Constitution. And this, uh, this ballot initiative comes up um, November 3rd, and uh, if it passes, California takes another step downward. Uh, interestingly enough, the, I was approached during uh, earlier today by a um, attendee who is, happens to be the son of the founding dean of the UC Berkeley School of Public Policy. His name is Adam Waldowski, and he handed me or uh, notified me of an article that was written by uh, Stephen Hayward, who has a um, sort of a, a temporary, tenuous position at UC Berkeley. Um, it was an article that he wrote in Commentary Magazine in the current issue, uh, July, August, called um, How I Ran Afoul of Campus Can Cancel Culture. 
And in this article, um, Stephen Hayward, who I know and who uh, may, maybe many of you in this room uh, know him also, uh, he's, uh, he's had a multi-varied career, but he's managed to get a position at uh, UC Berkeley, as tenuous as it is, um, at least for the last few years. And um, in this article, he says that the shift has been so great that the founding dean of this school of public policy, who's Aaron Waldowski, would not be able to get the position that he held now. It's that bad. And I had asked uh, Adam to, um, yes, do you want to come to the microphone and uh, verify? So this is the amazing thing, you know? Uh, we actually can gain by uh, interacting. Um, so do you want to say anything about your dad or um, some? I, it's, sometimes it's difficult to shut me up. But uh, yeah, I don't think my dad could be hired today for any position at the school that he founded. It, it's a sad commentary, but it, it, it's the way of the world. I would, I, I have strong feelings on uh, Proposition 16. I consider it uh, a new Jim Crow, since it uh, allows the government to discriminate, whereas uh, previously it couldn't. My, my dad was uh, a big opponent of what he called radical egalitarianism. And he has, uh, I mean, things have only got worse today. He died in 1993. He was going to speak here at the 1993 conference. That's, uh, that was my introduction to DDP. I came to the conference in Oakland to hear him speak and to hear Dr. Beckman speak. I was a big fan of Dr. Beckman also. And uh, both of them were, were, were too ill to speak that summer, and they uh, passed away shortly thereafter. So I have to take issue with uh, Ward Connolly's note, not about his sentiments, but about the wording he used. He, he said equality was a great uh, good but uh, equality is used in several different senses. The sense that he meant was equality of rights, and I'm all for that. But you know, what my dad pointed out was that uh, the radical, radical egalitarians want equality of condition. They all want us to achieve the same thing, regardless of our merits or efforts. And that, uh, that's an unspeakable evil. It's, it, 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 it's led to dreadful... Uh, dreadful results whenever it's been put into practice. And uh, yeah, that's all I got for now. But uh, you want to uh, hear anything else, bug me well, later. Well, I guess maybe it's now. These are some conclusions I came to you can look at uh, on the screen. Uh, I think we really need, uh, as I've said before, we need to reach out to the different interest groups here and especially see if we can get uh, students uh, to understand the difference between education and indoctrination. And so I guess I'd be pleased to take um, questions, if there are questions now. more uh, comment and question. Uh, you probably have never heard of the uh, Pitkin's postulate. That's because you probably don't know Ed Pitkin. He's a buddy of mine. But what he did was he, he said that the Peter principle is wrong. Is that working? Okay. Uh, there we go. The, the Peter principle is wrong in the most important cases. Peter Principle says that people rise to their level of incompetence and stay there forever. He pointed out that there are a lot of people, and you all know university presidents, et cetera, who have passed this, <clears throat> who approach their level of incompetence with such speed that they tunnel through and thereafter encounter negative resistance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just 
Just quickly on your list of conclusions, the next to the last one talks about students, parents, and taxpayers. You left out one group, alumni. And oh. you know, college presidents are really yes. just chief fundraisers in chief, and they try to roll alumni for cash. So have you looked at getting alumni to show up at these little breakfasts and say, hey, what's going on? Because the, the people who donated money to the university when I went there that I benefited from wouldn't put up with this. And why do you want me to give you money? Well, look, there has been an effort in the last couple of years to organize um, what are called Republican alumni. We've just been unable to get any cooperation from the Alumni Association. Uh, we've sort of done this independently by going back over the years of the existence of the Bruin Republicans. But to give you an idea of how difficult it is, the Alumni Association of UCLA has approximately 500,000 members and I would dare say that there are probably a substantial number of Republicans, maybe as many as 20%, because it didn't used to be this liberal. But uh, they've refused to give me any access to a mailing, to, because they say the university's apolitical. Uh, how hypocritical. They can send out notices to the black alumni, the uh, the Chicano alumni, the uh, undocumented alumni, all of those groups I'm sure are almost entirely democratic. Um, and um, they have no interest in, in a helping to, uh, to get the alumni. But we've, I've been trying to work with um, individuals within the university and alumni, like you say, um, it's not pleasant. This is not a pleasant task to tear, tear down a university where you spent your career. But I'm, um, I'm going to keep at it because uh, you can see what's happening to California. And a lot of this is driven by the esteemed professors at the University of California. Go ahead. Uh, Jim, uh, you mentioned you can only take so much. And I think what's happening is everywhere you turn, there's no help. There's Absolutely. no help from the president's office, no help from the journals you publish in, no help from the representatives, you know, the congressmen, so on, no help from the committees. And my question really is, what's behind that? How come we are alone and individuals and isolated and the world seems to be against us? Is there a mass madness or are there people leading and controlling and manipulating uh, America. Do you know, do you understand well, that question? Well, um, I believe that uh, part of it was explained by the student uh, who was talking about the hiring process. I mean, the hiring process basically excludes people uh, like both you and I got into the university in the uh, early 70s. I would never have gotten to the UC uh, system if I hadn't, um, you know, had uh, great opportunities uh, at, at the beginning. Uh, it just wouldn't happen. So there, there's, it's now, uh, I mean, how could I get through this? Even if Einstein can't get an appointment at UCLA, how could I possibly get one? So um, maybe you should identify yourself for those that, uh, aren't, uh, oh, I'm, aren't familiar. I'm, I'm, I'm Bob Phelan, and uh, it was my pleasure when Jim was first attacked uh, to defend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, these are great from the, uh, from the store here, and uh, you forget you have them on. It's like not having anything on. I, you know, eat, try to eat through it and so on. I'm, I'm Bob Phelan. Uh, Jim came to me when he was first attacked, and uh, in my opinion, he's, he's the best epidemiologist I've ever met, and I've met a lot. I'm a faculty member at Irvine, and uh, so I, it was my great honor and pleasure to uh, defend him, uh, to recommend him uh, to the department, and so on, but what he's been through is, is really unspeakable, and uh, when I came to the microphone, I, was, I really had that question, are we looking at mass madness, as perhaps occurred in Germany in the 20s and 30s, or are we looking at 
some sort of controlling entities, organizations, people, etc., that are managing uh, these terrible circumstances. That was my question, but when I got to the microphone, I thought, heck, I'd almost rather just say, let's give Jim a big applause, you know, because he certainly deserves it. Thanks. Thank you.